Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's edition of HR Mentorship Learning Series. We'll be looking at a very interesting topic, the role of human resources in ensuring compliance with data privacy regulations for employee information. And today we have someone who is going to be engaging with us with respect to this topic. And her name is Balogun Olua Fumilayo, and she is an engineer by background. I'll just share a few about her so we can get better acquainted with her. Okay, first and foremost, she has a Bachelor's of Engineering from Ondo State University at Doekiti, and then she has a Master's degree in Artificial Intelligence and its application from the University of Essex in UK. Okay, she also has different certifications from countries and organizations in South Africa, among others. By way of her career experience, she worked with systems engineer. She worked as a systems engineer with Chips Bytes and Bytes Limited for 12 years. That in itself is powerful. Okay, in addition to that, subsequently, she moved to Mamre Technology CC, where she served for about two and a half years in the capacity of business development. Then she joined SNG Grant Tonton where she has been for the last 12 years. And she is a cyber security specialist. This organization is headquartered, is based in South Africa. And I think in the last three months, she has transited to Grant Totton UK LLP. I believe it must be a sister company where she has been functioning in the capacity of information technology audit manager in the last three months. I'm sure we'll get to you, know her even more. Thank you so much, Olufumilayo, for obliging at this point. I'm excited to hand over control to you. Please let's show us some warmth and love with all the virtual emoticons and emojis we can muster. Over to you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Adioshum. I really appreciate your time and also giving me this opportunity. Um, to present myself and also to present the topic, um, which is an interesting one, the role of HR, that is human resources, in ensuring compliance with data privacy regulations for employee information. So um, before I move on, he has already introduced me. Then I will say it again that um, I'm Olua Fumila Yobalogu. Um, presently, I'm with Grant Hunton UK, um, but for over 10 years, I was with Grant Hunton South Africa before I recently moved to the UK. And I'm looking forward to walking you through these data privacy regulations this day. I will not say evening because, um, you know, the different people from different part of the world are watching it. It might be night in some places or even afternoon in some places. So I would just say, good day, colleagues, and I trust you are all doing well. So I'm presenting this. Um, I'm, 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 I will be doing this presentation on data privacy regulations. And mostly I uh, will be referring, since the host is from Nigeria, I will be referring mostly to the data privacy regulations in Nigeria, but I will be touching base as well with that of South Africa and um, the UK and also some other ones from the part of the world, but mostly I'll be concentrating with the one used in Nigeria. Thank you all. So just feel relaxed as we move on. Looking at data privacy, what exactly do we need when we say data privacy? And, um, and at the same time, we can also say this logo talking about HR mentorship and HR compliance. And I believe that um, there are so many people on this call. This is not only for HR. We have HR people here, but there are some cybersecurity guys also on this call and also and people in auditing that are also on the score. 
So I will try to cut across, cut it across all the fields, but mostly I will concentrate on HR compliance since um, this is HR platform. So when we talk about data privacy, um, at times I can mention data privacy or data protection, it is, it is also the same thing. So the key word there is data. So what do we need? What you need to know? Um, how to guide your data, how to pro um, protect your data, how to protect your information. So data, I will also use the same word interchangeably, either data or information. So because some countries, they call it um, personal information and some call it personal data. But um, in Nigeria, for the case of tonight's study and um, presentation, in Nigeria, we we'll call it um, personal data. But in South Africa, we we'll call it personal information. And in the UK, we'll call it personal data. So I will, uh, I will explain as I move on. So the objectives, this is um, talking to the point, what we want to cover today. So we'll be looking at the objectives, um, then the personal information breaches, data privacy law, privacy laws around the world, not only in these three countries, it's also applicable in almost, I mean, more than half of the countries in the world. And then the key role players, what is personal data according to NDPR, then the principles that apply to processing personal data and the steps to be compliant as, um, as an HR personnel. So that is um, our content, what we'll be talking to today. If I'm moving too fast, please let me know. So um, I'm going to ask us this question and then what exactly do you want to achieve today? What do you want to see? Can you please put it in the chat box? What do you want to achieve? What are your objectives? What are your objectives? I'm not going to populate. If we have, can we put in the chat box? What do we want to achieve today? Yes, to get insights into data privacy. That's good. Any other one? Okay. Okay, we're receiving now. Measures to protect data, that's a good one. Thank you to Malang. It's a colleague from South Africa, but is presently in the UK. <laughs> okay, let's look at the objectives. To assist HR professionals understand their data protection, responsibilities and liabilities, you know, be responsible and also liable for the data and how to manage employee data in compliance with data privacy protection laws and regulations. And this talks to employment life cycle. So when we talk about employment life cycle, what do we mean? So employment life cycle um, begins from when the candidate starts having conversation with the hiring person and then moving from that to the recruitment section stage, the onboarding stage, the retention stage, um, the development, the offboarding, and also the upper levers. That is a complete, I would say, complete metamorphosis of employment life cycle. So it, it's not only limited to um, when the onboarding, it's also caught across until the employee will leave the organization. So that is number one, what we want to achieve. Okay, I'm also getting this in the chat box. The under, to understand the implications of data breach, yes, fine. To understand compliance and data privacy as it pertains to HR. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, okay, then the next one, what else again do we want to achieve today? 
and um, that data subjects, the data subjects should be able to gain knowledge and also awareness of a data protection and principles and also the requirements. So this also talks to NDPR. So NDPR is Nigerian Data Protection Regulation. GDPR is General Data Protection Regulation. So NDPR is what we use in Nigeria. GDPR is what we use in the UK and also EU. And POPI is what we use in South Africa and which is called Protection of Personal Information. And all these, all these are also applicable to employee data. So that is also what we want to achieve today, that as a data subject, you also need to gain understanding to have knowledge, be aware of what happens to your data. You don't just leave your data there. Then um, thirdly, what do we want to achieve? To understanding of how to implement and communicate data privacy policies and procedures to the employees and educate staff on data privacy issues. So this is also related to our HR professionals in, um, in, on this call. So as an HR professional, you must be able to understand that what are the policies that I need to uh, develop, what are the policies that I need to implement regarding data privacy, and then what are the procedures to these employees and how do I educate my staff? because you have them, they are your staff as an HR professional. Then the next stage, okay. So what is data privacy? If I may ask the question, what is data privacy? What is data privacy? Okay, so data privacy refers just like the way it was pronounced and also written. So we can say making our data to be private, you know, just literary meaning. So data privacy refers to the rights a citizen, at least we are all citizens of a country. We might not be citizens of Nigeria. There are so many South Africans on this call, even people from the UK also on this call. So data privacy refers to the right a citizen has over how the personal data is collected. So meaning that you have the right as a citizen of your country, of how your personal data has been collected by your organization. That is by the company you're working for, and whether it is shared with third parties or not. So you must be aware where your personal information is going, where your personal data is, whether it is being shared. And in other words, data privacy deals with the proper handling of personal and confidential data of employees and customers. So I'm not going to, um, initially I thought of being employees but customers and then in all of our organizations, we also have customers. I will also say stakeholders. I will not be expecting to see people's ID all over flying on the tables or even in the bin. If it's going to be trashed, it should be trashed properly. So now we'll talk about data privacy. Then if we need to talk about the law, the regulation, and that is what we're looking at today that is ensuring HR compliance to data privacy regulation, which is also the same thing as law. So when we talk about data privacy regulation, it is the legal framework on how to maintain, I say that again. So it is a binding, legal binding on how to obtain, how do we collect the information? So when we say obtaining, that is, how do we collect this personal data? How do we use the personal data? How do we store the data of natural persons? Natural persons. Natural persons are human beings. Then um, another law, I think another country says only the living being 
I remember, okay, for South Africa law, it says only the living being. So this data privacy law is applicable to only living beings. So the principal data protection regulation used in Nigeria is called NDPR. So NDPR is the same thing as Nigeria Data Protection Regulation 2019. This came to place in 2019. Then the one being used in South Africa is not here, I didn't write it here, but which I've mentioned before, it is called POPIA, Protection of Personal Information Act. And the one used in the UK is General Data Protection Regulation. So the one we're using in Nigeria, which I'll be talking to mostly, is called NDPR. So I want to take us around the world now to see what happens in the world. So, uh, you know, I've only mentioned three countries, but um, there's so many countries also with their own data privacy regulation. Um, okay, this is UK here. In the UK, we're using GDPR. Some people are also using, um, some people are using, there's also another one being used in the UK. Then um, this is Russia, they call it Federal Law of CII Security. They also have three. So there are some countries with three, like UK, they, they have UK and EU, they have two. Then in China, um, they call it cybersecurity law. And there's also another one which they call personal information protection law. Then in um, South Korea, it is data residency laws for certain industries. So we have this all over Kenya, um, UAE, and also India. So we have this all over. And um, then Vietnam, Singapore, Indonesia. So like I said, I'm taking us around the world. Okay, because you might be wondering that this is Africa here, and um, this is not picking for Africa. Um, it's only picking for Kenya and picking for South Africa, like I said, protection of personal information act. Um, <laughs> so people will be wondering what happened to Nigeria. Where's Nigeria not coming up here? So, but this is another one, you know, I said, I'm taking us around the world. So uh, yeah, this is um, EU. They are also using e-privacy regulation. And this is the one we're using in Nigeria. It came into place in April, 2019, data protection regulation. And, um, you know, South Africa is also here, Uganda is here, Kenya, all over. So um, each of our countries, they have their own privacy law. And um, this is also defined based on what happens within their space. So looking at the objectives of this regulation. So the objectives of this regulation are as follows. So now we're looking at NDPR, we're focusing mostly on NDPR. So what is the objective? Why was this regulation, I mean, developed? Why do we have it? Number one is to safeguard the rights of natural persons to data privacy. That is, I have the right to save I mean, I have the right for the privacy of my data. So, and also to foster safe conduct for transactions involving the exchange of personal data. And in terms of, you know, when there is exchange of personal data, so what happens? And also to prevent manipulation of personal data, um, which is really common. So we need to prevent it. That is also one of the objective. We have so many objectives but we we'll try to reduce it, um, I mean, due to um, our timing, and also to ensure that Nigerian businesses, companies, organizations remain competitive in international trade through the safeguards afforded by just and equitable legal regulatory framework on data protection, and which is in turn with best practice. Um, because by the time your organization is also doing business with another international company, and those are the things that they will ask you, they will also consider that which law are you using? 
Um, our, our, are we even sure that our data is secured? Are we sure that our data is safe with you? And the same thing also, you will be asking them that, are you sure that the data of your employees are also safe with them? So those are the things, and that those are the reasons why we need to have all these laws. Then, um, okay, the next slide. So the next slide talks to, okay. Um, okay, so if, if somebody is going to ask me, if you don't do this, what is going to happen? Um, okay, in South Africa, we'll call it robots. That is traffic lights. We'll call it traffic lights in Nigeria, but in South Africa, we'll call it robots. So I'm going to ask you, you said, um, if I jump the robots, that is, if I didn't obey the traffic lights, nothing will happen. You know, when you say nothing will happen, I will just decide to just move anyhow. So if I didn't obey this law, if I don't follow this law, what's going to be the penalty? You know, when there is a law and there's no penalty, just be assured that people will break the law. And that is the reason why these penalties are put in place. So we'll call it data privacy law penalties, penalties of non-compliance, penalties of non-compliance. So let us look at those penalties. Right, the first one talks about the regulation, regulation 2.10 of the NDPR provides that the National Information Technology Development Agency, this is the agency um, that puts in place the law. So may impose fines in respect of a breach of the provisions of the regulation. Um, I could remember that somebody also said so that um, he or she wants to know more about the breaches and also what happened if I break this. So that is a fine. So it imposes fines in respect of a breach. If you breach this law, it is a law, it is a regulation. So you're going to be fined as, as an organization, as an entity, you're going to be fined. And then in the case of a data controller, I'm going to explain to us later um, who this data controller is, but the data controller is the entity that is the organization. If the organization is dealing with more than 10,000 data subjects, so payment of a fine of 2% of annual gross revenue of the preceding year, or payment of a sum of 10 million naira, Let's just leave the one above. Let's just go straight to this one that says the sum of 10 million naira, which is greater, will be paid. You could imagine some might be saying 10 million naira, I will easily pay. But if you pay 10 million naira today, and then what happens to you next tomorrow, next year, you also default, and then you pay 10 million naira. There are some other fines apart from the money. So some will see and they say, ah, oh, no, there's nothing much in the money. But it, it, it can also cause um, reputational damage to your organization and then loss of customer or confidential trust. No one will want to do business with you if their data are not secured with you. Let's say, for example, you're a financial institution and then uh, before you see it in the next one year, uh, the data, uh, there was a breach of, of, of of, um, of data and the thing it's all over there. You will not want to do business with them. You will not want to do business with them. And then in the case of data controller, that is the entity dealing with less than 10,000 data subjects, payment of a fine of 1% of the annual gross revenue of the preceding year or payment of a sum of 2 million naira, whichever one is greater, so will be paid. So, uh, and the impact, the impact of non-compliance, we've mentioned it. If you're not careful, it will lead to financial loss. So that's the reason why we need to abide by this law. So let's look at this. Um, the key role players, you'll see that in between I was mentioning data controller, I was mentioning data subject and all those things. So looking at this, let's start with the data protection compliance organizations. So we'll come back to that. I will explain 
So it flows this way. This is data protection compliance organization. Then it, it flows to the data protection officer, then to the data controller, the data processor, and then the data subject. So who is the data subject? If I may ask, can you put it in the chat? Who is the data subject? Okay, I think I have, there's a question here. Where can we access the data protection laws for Nigeria? Um, there's a website, I will give it to you later. Okay, who is the data subject? Okay, end users, yes, correct. Thank you to Meleng. Yeah, end users are the data subjects. So I put here you and I, we are the data subjects. So NDPR provides guidelines for the collection. That is our guideline. Um, that is, I will say that is our director. Uh, that is, um, yeah, our director, our guideline that says, this is how data must be collected data must be stored, it must, the way it must be transmitted, the way it must be processed, and then it also articulates and creates the following rules and activities. So apart from guiding us of how we're going to collect data, how we're going to store it for, um, for how long, the storage, the transmission, and then how do we process it? So then these rules and activities were also provided along with it. So like I said, data protection compliance organization. So this is the entity that duly licensed, that was duly licensed for the purpose of monitoring. So we should not just think that in my own organization, I can do whatever I like, I can do whatever I want with the data I'm being, I'm, I mean, I've collected. But remember that this organization is a body that monitors whatever you do concerning data. It monitors whatever you do concerning personal data. It's also auditing you. The body can also audit you. The body can also conduct training and also provide data protection compliance. So the, this body will tell you that these are the things that you need to do in terms of your data protection and also consulting to all data controllers in Nigeria. So who are the data controllers? Data controllers are the organization that collects the data. The entity, the company, I will say, for example, my company that is Brown Thornton is a data controller. We collect the data. Your company is also a data controller because you collect the, um, the data and you collect those personal data. And then who are the data processor? The data processor are those ones that you give the data to, to process on your behalf because there's some data that will leave your place. There's some personal data that will leave your place and go to like the third party. Those are the data processor. And um, okay, I think I've not mentioned this one. This is the data protection officer. Who, what is, who is this person and what is this person responsible for? So the data protection officer is responsible for overseeing a company's data protection strategy. So meaning that the strategy must be defined, it's, it must be implemented to ensure compliance as an entity. An entity must ensure compliance, not only HR, but for the purpose of today's presentation, um, I will also talk about the entire organization and then narrow it down to HR. But it is also the responsibility of the DPO, Data Protection Officer, to oversee this data protection strategy and also the implementation in compliance to NDPR. So we've talked about the data controller, which is the organization that collects the data and personal data and data processor processes any data on behalf of the data controller and data subjects, it's um, you and I. Then I move to the next slide. Okay. 
Then my question again, what is personal data? You can put it on the chat. What is personal data? How do you understand personal data? Yes, Michael Mobolaji. Yes, this will be shared. The presentation will be shared. What is personal data? What do you understand as personal data? Anyone? Okay, Larry. Personal data, personal information of individuals, correct? Yes. Any other person? Okay. So when we'll talk about, okay, prevention of individual information without being disclosed, unauthorized, yeah, okay. Okay. Examples mix date of birth, yeah, sensitive information of staff, correct? Yeah, or some, the information that are private and peculiar to an individual, correct, 100% correct. Thank you all. So when we talk about um, personal data, it is your name, whatever belongs to you. Whatever belongs to you is your personal data. Your name is your personal data, your address, your localization, online identifier, whichever name you decide to be known as. You know, some people will have different names on their social media platforms, on um, Instagram, on Facebook, they use different names. So whatever name that you want to use, it is your online identifier, it is your personal data, your health information. Your health information is your personal data. We also have and there are some regulations and laws that guide um, health industry. And this is called HIPPA. Then your income, your salary, your person is a personal information, your cultural profile, where you're from, your state, even when it comes to the issue of political party is also your personal information. Political party, because you can decide to say no, I will be going with um, which one? PDP or um, Labour Party or ANC in South Africa. Yeah, so it is your personal information. So let's look at this. Personal data is any information that relates to an identified or identifiable individual. So means this is not applicable to animals. This is applicable to human beings, living human beings, to an identified or identifiable individual. Personal data embodies the tiniest of details that could relate to us. Tiniest of detail. Some might be thinking, but your address, your address is all over. People can have access to your address. No, it is your personal data, tiniest of details that belongs to you, to an individual, it's your personal data. And it can be anything from a name, address, your photo. And then um, that is the reason why you see some people that, well, it's unfortunate some of us don't even know our rights. No one should have access to use your photo, your photograph for any adverts without dancing your concept. You can sue the company, you can sue the individual, but the thing is we don't know our rights. And that is one of the objectives we'll get to know today. So your bank details, your post on social networking websites, your medical information, and all the unique identifier such as, but not limited to your MAC address, your MAC address on your laptop, your IP address. Your IP address is your personal data. Your IME number, that is for your phone. IMS number, same, it is your personal data. Um, then your PI, yeah. This is what we use in South Africa, personal identifiable information and other things. 
So personal identifiable information means information that can be used on its own or with other information to identify, to contact you, even your phone number. No one should have the right to share your phone number without getting consent from the data subject. So there should be consent before sharing someone else's phone number with another person. Look at all. Okay, we're talking about here that PII, the meaning of PII on its own or with other information to identify, contact or locate a single person. Your location is also your personal data or to identify an individual in a context. So if you need it to be identified in a context, it is your personal data. It is your personal data. Okay, thank you. I think I'm receiving emails. Um, where we're going to send it. Okay, we'll go through the coordinator. Thank you. You you get the you get the slides. Yeah. So the next slide talks about key principles that apply to the data process to processing of personal data. What are the principles? Who can remind us of the law? What is the regulation that guides? Processing of data in Nigeria. Who can remind us? Put it in the chat. Correct. To my link. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this is the principle. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> Larry. Yeah. The guides processing of personal data. So within this processing, we have seven steps that we need to follow. The first one talks about fair and lawful processing. So you have a personal data. So when you need to process it, it must be lawful. So what do we mean as being lawful? Processing should be adequate, relevant, and limited to necessity of a purpose for which it is being collected with the knowledge or consent of a data subject. And the processing activity should be transparent to the data subject. I'm going to give a simple scenario. You collected my data, you collected, let's say for example, um, collecting my CV, I applied to your organization, you took my CV, you were processing it with my consent, and then, Someone else called me that um, I got your CV from a friend. Um, will you want to apply for the job? That is unlawful because I didn't give the CV to the friend. My CV was given to you in your organization. So that is unlawful. You're processing my CV in an unlawful way and it's not fair. So it must be processed with the consent, with the knowledge, with the consent, with the knowledge of a data subject. And then the second key principle talks about lawful basis for processing it. Processing shall be lawful if the data subject has given consent to the processing of his or personal data for one or more specific purposes. We have those challenges. I'm not sure if you also experience, it, experience that. People will just call you. you. You can imagine random people calling you. Um, do you want to buy insurance? Do you want to do this? Do you want to sell insurance? Do you, you'll just be wondering, where do they get your number from? Where do they get your cell number from? You see, they are, with, Meaning that you've given your cell number to someone, but it's now in another person's hand. One or more specific purposes. You've not given those ones consent, but your cell numbers are with them. Then processing is necessary for the performance of a contract to which the data subject is party or in order to take steps at the request of the data subject prior to entering a contract. So before you enter a contract, there must be consent. Or even when you are in the contract, so necessary for the performance of a contract. So that means it is needed 
for example, your organization, in your organization, you, you need to, um, what's it called? Uh, this health, health insurance, and there are some organizations that will make it compulsory that you need to buy health insurance. So immediately you get into the organization, collecting all your data, everything will just fit in because it is for the performance of a contract. You've already signed contract with that entity. I'm going to use entity that is the name of a company, XYZ. So let's say the company is XYZ, as long as you've signed a contract with them. So for every of your, whether it is your appraiser to be performed, whether it is to process your salary, or to process your entitlement and everything. Yeah, that one is needed. So you don't, because you've already signed the content, um, consent, you've already agreed with the consent at the beginning. So processing is also necessary for compliance with a legal obligation to which the controller is subject. So when there is a legal issue, there's a consent that you also need to sign. So we're looking at legal processing now. And then processing is necessary in order to protect the vital interest of a data subject or of a natural person. And processing is necessary for the performance of a task carried out in the public interest or in the interest of public, of official public mandate vested in the controller. So I just want to believe that, um, you know, our politicians that expected to declare their assets before, you know, immediately they get in there being elected, they're expected to declare the assets. So um, I'm not sure how the process works, but I'm just thinking in my mind that the next thing will be that the government will not go and check and verify. You know, before anybody can go and check and verify, they need to get your consent. But now this is necessary for the performance of their task. So they don't need to get their consent. So there are some things that are lawful that you don't need the consent, but everything would have been signed at the beginning. And we'll get to know all the policies that HR professionals needs to put in place in terms of um, employment, employment life circle. Then here we'll talk about accountability. So accountability refers to the regulation imposes a duty of care on a person in possession of a personal data. Let's say, for example, I'm an HR professional. There are so many, the personal data of the entire organization is with me. So, um, owners lies on me that I need to keep, I need to safeguard the data. You know, a care, a care must be given to the data. So processing by third party should be governed by written contract between the third party and the data controller. So if my empl employee's data needs to be moved to third party, there must be an agreement between me, the data controller, the entity, the company XYZ and third party that nothing must happen to the data, um, sorry, to the personal data I'm sending to you. So that is what is called accountability. So this is also continuation of the key principles, then purpose limitation. Personal data shall be collected, processed in accordance with specific, legitimate, and lawful purpose consented to by the data subject. It must be lawful. There must be consent from the data subject, provided that a further processing may be done only for achieving scientific research, historic research, or statistical purposes for public interest. Only for those purposes, only for those purposes, that, that is when further processing should occur. And then data minimization, Whatever data that is not needed should not be collected. As an entity, as a company, as an HR professional, whatever information that is not needed should not be collected. 
So the data controller or processor must ensure that the personal data to be processed is adequate, relevant, and all to be on a need to know basis in relation to the purposes for which it is being processed. For example, I'm coming to your office, I'm going to the office called XYZ, and I'm by the gate. So the gate man told me, sign, this is what was signed, gave me the book, I need to put my name, I need to put my surname, I need to put my address, I need to put my cell number. Why should, like, for example, I can imagine that um, I also need to populate um, my mar um, marital status. Is that needed? So this is where data minimization comes in. So what do you need my marital status for? By the gates, because I'm going to your company. It is not needed. So you limit the information you are getting. It should be only on the basis of a need to know. Then when it comes to the issue of retention, personal data should be stored only for the period within which it is reasonable required. Personal data no longer needed should be deleted based on global best practice for such operations. I know of um, um, these telecommunication service providers, their policy says data should be kept for only five years. So there should be um, a policy developed for how long are we going to keep I think for financial institutions, I think it's, it should be around five years or 10 years that they keep data. So you can not just keep, I mean, having data, 20 years data, 30 years data still with you. So there should be retention period. And then data security, this is highly very, very important in terms of the key principles. So anyone involved in data processing shall develop security measures to protect data. Such measures include, but not limited to protecting systems from hackers, setting up firewalls. Okay, this might be technical, but it's fine. I will try to explain. <laughs> so when we have personal data with us, we need to try as much as possible to put some controls in place to be able to guide against hackers. So one of those controls that we need to put in place, one of them is um, firewall, um, storing data securely with access to specific authorized individuals who are the people with access to this data, even within the same organization. Um, I can imagine some data will be personal data. Some will keep it on their desktops. Some will not even have folders. Some will have shared folders. Who are the people with access to these shared folders? It's just everyone, almost everyone within the organization will have access to these shared folders. Some will keep it, um, okay, so people are using Microsoft Teams. You know, they just create the team channel and then they keep it there. It is not limited. Everyone have, having access, even on the server, you know, then this also talks to the issue of password. How often do we change our passwords? And also employing data encryption technologies. Do you have these data encryption technologies? Are you using multi-factor authentication or you're using single sign-on? You know, developing organization policy for handling personal data. How do you, do you even have policy that talks to sensitivity? You know, data should be categorized. There's some public data, there's some sensitive data, there's some confidential data. Do you categorize them? If you don't know the data that you have, it will be difficult to categorize and then difficult to be able to assign people access to those data. And protection of email systems. And this is where the issue of hacking usually comes in, email systems, protection of email systems. Any emails that comes in, people just like clicking. Some will click and click and click and click link, and then continuous capacity building for staff. So these things, if they are lacking, it will also be a challenge for the personal data within our space. Then the rights of data subjects. Who are the data subjects? 
I want to see if we still remember. Who are the data subjects? If you can still remember, put it in the chat box. Okay, I think we'll come to your questions later. Uluwato Siyadewar, we'll come to your question later. Okay, thank you, yeah. So rights of data subjects, that is one of our objectives. So many of us do not know our rights. No one should have access to your um, photograph, use it for, I mean, um, advertisement without getting your consent, without letting you know, or even using your phone number or any of your personal data. You have the right to sue them. Even in any organization, you have the right to know, to ask um, the IT, to ask the HR, where are my personal data kept? So let's look at the rights of data subjects. So rights to information, individuals must informed, must be informed how their personal data is being processed, both where they have provided this directly to a data controller, or where the controller has obtained it from another source, that is the third party. So even if you obtain data from another source, from third party, you must let the data subjects be aware that I got your personal data from this party, right to information. So individuals must be informed. Then right to access. Individuals must be, must be informed when their personal data has been collected, and they must also be able to obtain or request and also be given information about the processing of their personal data. You must let me know what you're using my personal data for. The right to object. You can't forcefully force me that you need to use my personal data. I have the right to object that my personal data must not be processed. So what do we mean as processing? Processing is the same thing as using. So I'm just trying to use um, data privacy terminologies, which is called processing. So using is the same thing as processing your personal data. Then the right to data portability. Data subjects have the right to obtain all the personal data from a data controller in a universal machine readable format, or for that data to be ported to another service should they request it. So I can go, it is my right to go to my organization XYZ to say, I want to collect all my data. I don't want you to process it. And it must be given to me in a readable format. Then the right to an effective remedy. Data subjects have the right to have effective judicial remedy where they consider that their personal data was not processed in compliance with the law. So you have the right to sue. You have the right to lodge the case, right to compensation. A person whose rights have been found to be violated has a right to compensation for the damage, material or non-material suffered. Then the right to rectify, block, and erase. So individuals, you have the right to rectify, and you have the right to be able to rectify. Let's say, for example, my son was mistakenly written or um, documented. I have the right to rectify, or I have the right to change marital status from being single to be married or from married to be single, to block, to request and erase my data process about them to ensure that such data is accurate, complete, and kept up to date. And then um, the data controller also should be able to inform the data subject on a regular basis that please, as a data subject, you must make sure that your information with us is up to date and the right to object to marketing. You have the right to object to marketing. You see, sometimes when you're completing a form, there will be a small box there that do you want to opt out or you want to opt in? That is the meaning of right to object marketing. So data subject is entitled to object to the processing of visual data with the data controller intends to process for the purpose of marketing. You might not want that. At times you will see so many emails coming in from so many organizations is because you've been to the site and unknowingly you've just clicked that box that um, unknowingly you opted in. And that's the reason why you're receiving so many of those emails. 
So, but you can also unsubscribe. Okay, the next slide. Steps of compliance. So this is the key one. This is where we are now going to dwell as an HR professional and also as an employee and also as an employer. So looking at NDPR, which we know, that is Nigeria Data Protection Regulation, the steps to comply. What do we need to do? This is a generic one, but I will not take us try to dig deep as we move on. For you to comply as an organization, you need to appoint a data protection officer. That is a DPO, which will be responsible for the um, data protection strategy with com competence, knowledge, and authority. So this one must have, the com must have the skill, must have the knowledge, and also the authority. And then you also need to sensitize and train directors, um, even all the stakeholders on the obligations under NDPR. Um, management should not come and say, no, these are for IT, or these are for HR, or these are for uh, marketers, uh, marketing department. It is for the entire organization. So everyone must be trained. Implement appropriate cyber and data security measures, which is very, very important. You need to put encryption in place. Um, MFA, you need to put, there is no one size fit all in terms of security. So you need to put layers and layers and layers of security in place to be able to secure this data and personal data. You also need to develop and communicate data protection and privacy policy to all stakeholders. So this is very, very highly important. Um, data protection and privacy policies, not only one, must be developed. So this must be developed. And then you must be able to conduct annual audits to get professional advice on compliance gaps and possible remediation option and submit to NITDA. So there must be annual audit. So instead of using the word audit, I can say there must be um, gap analysis. Gap analysis must be performed annually to be able to know where whatever it is that is shorting and then the organization can put it in place. Conduct a DPI to mitigate risk. That is impact assessment. Data privacy impact assessment. So this is also referring to the gap to be able to know where the risks are, the threats, the vulnerabilities, and the breaches. You know, if impact assessments are not conducted, you will not know what you have. I will just use this simple scenario. You have your house. If you do not compact, uh, conduct impact assessments, you are not able to see that um, you have this number of gold and this is the worth of your gold. You have this TV, television set, this is the worth of your TV. You will not be able to put enough controls in place. But when you know that these are your assets and then these are the controls that you have in place and then these are your risk. Your entrance door is not secured enough. Um, you don't even have the key and all those things. So by the time you are able to uh, conduct that impact assessment, it will assist you to be able to know where your risks are, the threats, where you're vulnerable, and then in case there might be breaches, and then you put the controls in place. So this is um, the general way of being compliant to um, NDPR. But now we'll move to, we want to drill down to, sorry, to HR now. So as an HR personnel, what do you do? You must have a checklist. So you must have a checklist to be able to say, it depends, it might just be three checklists. And then you say, one, are we okay? You pick it, two, we're not yet there. Three, we're halfway done. Then when that is done, you will know where to start and how to go about it. So what should we say about data privacy protection in our contract of employment? You know, like I mentioned that, as an um, as 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 an HR personnel, as an HR personnel, um, there is employment life cycle. So employment life cycle covers 
from the time you start engagement, engaging the employee until the employee leaves. So not only the period of onboarding and all those things. So it is the time you start engaging and then to the time of onboarding, outboarding and everything. So, but the thing is in the contract of employment, people now put, you know, it has always been there before to say that um, terms and conditions, you know, before we call it terms and conditions. But now um, when it comes to data privacy, it is more than that. So um, what we do, which uh, I'm also going to show us later is that so many policies must be developed and this will guide us of what to do. So we used to incorporate a consent. So we'll call it a consent. Some organizations call it terms and conditions um, to processing the contract. So there are so many ones that are old, many other contracts will still have this wording. So this should be updated. So this consent should be updated. In fact, I would suggest that the consent should be removed and then put in another document. So consent no longer a realistic grant for processing in the employment relationship. Other grants of processing are available. So a contract must be developed and it is a legal obligation. So it's going to be a separate document which will be given to each of the employees to read, to go through, and then to sign. And the sensitive personal data such as L data also requires its own grants so you cannot combine all of them together. Initially before, there's always a consent underneath, but this does not work because and at, at the same time, it's not going to cover all areas. But when you have a contract, a separate contract, so, and that is where you're going to list all those things, then it will be able to address all those areas. And you might also call it a legal obligation. And employers must be open and transparent about what is done with the data. So in the contracts, apart from, um, apart from the employment contracts, there, there must be another contract. And here, HR must be able to state that these are the data we're collecting from you. And this is what we'll use the data for. And this is where we're going to store your data. And this is this, you know, you have to state everything. So in your contract points, employees towards the information. So this document is called privacy notice policy. It is called privacy notice policy. Okay, so what are privacy notices and why should HR care about them? So, and this is to provide certain information to data subjects. Privacy notices, some call it staff, because this is only meant for staff, yeah. So some call it staff notices, staff privacy notices. So staff privacy notices are principal way your organization tells employees the workers or applicants about the processing of their data. I remember sometimes when I was applying, in fact, before they even start the process of verifying my certificate, there was a consent letter that was given to me separately, a consent letter given to me separately to sign. So, and um, the organization said, I need to sign it <laughs> black and white ink. They want ink, they want it signed. So I had to look for a printer, print, sign, send to them before they could process my results. So that is how it is. And there is a policy that guides, and this must be developed by each company. There's a privacy policy that guides um, the organization, but it depends on how you want to do it in your own HR department, some will even call it people and culture, it depends on the name you call it, but it is the same thing, whether you call it HR or people and culture. So it depends on how you want to do it, but it's always good to be on the safe side. So mandatory information includes legal contact details of your organization, which must be there in the privacy notice policy and the identity of the DPO, if you have one, and um, we know who the DPO is, the types of data being processed, 
what are the data that we process, you know, the address, the name, the cell number, date of birth, and all those things. The source of the data, the grant for processing it. You must let me know as an HR, why do you want to process this? How long it is stored for? How long are you going to store my data? Any use of automated decision making, any transfers outside the country. So also need to tell the individual about the rights, including the right to complain. And that is why some people that are adding this place, you know, some of them will not let the data subjects be aware of their rights. And there is also need to be issued at the point at which the data is processed, that is the consent form. So some organizations have separate recruitment privacy policy. Just like what I said, some it depends on the organization. Some will say this is our recruitment private policy, and it will be different from staff privacy policy, and then even referee privacy policy. So, but it depends on you, but you can have all together, and then you now have different edits. Do not really need, do you really need data protection policy? Do you really need it? Fine, yes or no, yes and no. So do not really need a separate data protection policy if you have a privacy policy. Reason is as much as possible, you can try as much as possible to reduce the number of policies that you have. Like I always tell people when it comes to the issue of information security policy, I tell them that you don't have to have separate change management policy, backup policy, you know, having those incident management policy, you don't have to have them separately as long as it is IT. You can incorporate everything into the information security policy. So I always call the information security policy the big policy because you can have everything inside. So instead of you having data protection policy separately, you can also include it in the privacy notice policy. And what is the purpose of this data protection policy? This is to guide employees to set out organizations expectations of workers when dealing with data, the process they should follow and the help and support available to them. It can also I mean, it can also cover categories of data, that is processes to follow when handling data at work, how the organization approaches data protection impact assessment, which has been mentioned, transferring data externally and permissions required, security of data, data breaches, data subject rights, and disciplinary sanctions. Sometimes in one of the organizations I've worked before, I saw somebody's ID um, on the table. So I was just wondering, how come that one's ID will be on the table? And this ID was collected for the purpose of proposal. So after finalizing the proposal, why can't you keep, keep them away or you destroy them, you know, just the ad copy at that moment, destroy or you keep them away? And you know, this person can be disciplined. The person can be disciplined because of this. That is data protection policy. So that's the reason why we need to have all this policy to be able to guide ourselves as an HR professional and also to guide the data subjects. Other HR policies, which I said that we need to put in place, um, employee compliance commitments, so when we talk about employee compliance commitment, this talks about how the employee should use the cell phone, how they should use the email. You know, some people, they have their office, office email on the phone. So meaning that your phone must be running on the latest, um, on, the, on the latest patches. Then the email, how do you use office email? Do you use it for personal stops? Or even if you're using it for official, what site? Someone was sacked because he was going to these bigger sites. Then office phone, apart from cell phone, browsing the web, printers, you know, shared printers. How do you use it? When you're traveling, you go with the official laptop. Where do you keep them? How do you manage them? Then the use of public hotspots. 
Is it safe for you to use public hotspots, public Wi-Fi? You know, using it on your official, even I can use it on my personal, not using it on your official um, laptop. So this policy must also be put in place. Then this compliance awareness plan must also be put in place. NDPR compliance awareness plan is different from security awareness training. That is where people are always missing it off. Security awareness training is different from data privacy compliance awareness plan. So this section is to identify data privacy awareness plan, same rules that who are the, who are the people that will be responsible for data privacy awareness. Then we need to measure the success for any plan that you've done, for any awareness training that you've done, you need to measure the success. Then you need to select the awareness method. Is it going to be physical training? Is it going to be online? Is it going to be through you know, pictures and all those things? And then when do you want to deploy the awareness? So this must also be put in place. And then the clean desk policy must be put in place. Clean desk policy. This is to ensure that all sensitive, you know, here we're talking about um, personal data, which are sensitive, which are confidential. So these materials must be removed from an end user workspace and locked away. You go to some offices, I cannot imagine at this age that some people are still using, you know, papers all over in some offices. So these must also be developed, clean this policy, as much as you still want to use hard copies, but it must be properly kept, locked with keys. So where does HR data go and why do we need to know? HR, they are the backbone of any organization because the employees start with them and also ends with them. So where do the data go? You need to know as an HR professional where it goes, in your location and also within the entity. Then the service providers. So here we're going to look at the service providers, including your IT system service providers. If they are sitting on your IT systems on the servers, do they have enough security controls around those things? And then apart from that, are you using external service providers? Is there any contract between your IT, in-house IT and these external service providers? Then the systems that you're using for payroll and the HR system, where are they sitting? Do they have enough security controls around the personal data? Then we also need to look at the intergroup sharing. There's some companies in, sorry, there's some companies in Nigeria, but the parent company is in South Africa. There's some companies in South Africa and the parent company is in the UK. So intra-group sharing, do they consider the security? Do they consider the regulations, the laws that governs this data, this um, personal data, and it's moving from one country to another country or as it's moving, from a parent company to a sister company. And all the recipients that also have access to this personal data, you share it with your occupational health, you share it with the pension providers, um, like these insurance, you also share it with the insurance companies, with the health insurance. So is there any contract between you, your company, and it is mostly with the HR. So it is HR that send this personal data to the pension providers. It is HR that send this personal data to the health insurance. So everything mostly is always moving from the HR to the service providers. So is there any contract? How do they ensure the accuracy? How do they ensure accountability? How do they ensure security of this personal data. And then what we were saying, where does HR data go and why do they need to know? Why do HR need to know? So the regulation requires you to know because as an HR professional, you might be asking, why should I know? So I'm telling you and I'm letting you know now that the regulation NDPR, 
Nigeria Data Protection Regulation says you must know where your data subjects' personal data are. And then secondly, your contracts with third parties will need to deal with the sharing and processing. You also need to tell people in your privacy notice. So the privacy notice policy, it's highly recommended. And then specific rules on transfers outside your country. So you must know whatever happens in the other country that you're moving, the data subject personal data to, that you're moving the personal data to. So you must know the regulation that guides them. So if, you're, if, if, if the personal data will be processed in that country, so it must also follow the rule and then it must also follow the rule of a country the personal data is coming from. So it's like using the two rules. So these are the action items plan for HR professionals for data privacy compliance. So these are the plans for HR. It's, these are mostly questions which we don't need to answer here. Have we identified the tasks to be undertaken within the HR team to contribute to overall NDPR compliance by the organization? Have we been able to identify that as an HR or in our department, you call it people and culture, what are the tasks that we need to undertake for us to be compliant to this regulation? Have we allocated identified tasks among our team or you just do things anyhow? In terms of training, you use people's data. And if you are, in, you are okay, there are some people that are in learning and development, they use people's data. Some people in terms of health, they use people's data, you know, different sections of HR. Some, in terms of um, appraisal and all those things, they use people's data. They will have access to the salary and everything. So have you been able to identify tax among your team to say that you will be responsible for keeping this data, you will be responsible for this? Have we educated and trained our HR team in terms of how they can achieve this task? When the task has been allocated, identified, are they trained? Have we conducted the risk of non-compliance assessment for the scope of the work of the HR team? Have we reviewed all policies for which HR is responsible in terms of NDPR compliance and made the necessary changes? You know, there are times that we review policies, but the changes are not made. Then have we identified the legal basis for processing of all personal data process in HR? What is the legal basis? for processing all the data, are they really needed? Can we prove the personal data process in HR is secure? Where do you keep them? The data are just all over the places. So can we prove the personal data process in HR is the minimum required for the purpose intended? If you don't require any information, we must not collect it from the data subject. So do we have the necessary management system in place for working with the operators? to support our processing of personal data in HR. What are they using? Are they still using ad copy for the post? They're using a system, is the system secured? So those are the questions. Territorial scope, which I've also mentioned. So territorial scope talks about moving the data to another country. So do this law apply to businesses established in other jurisdiction? If you need to do your business in other jurisdiction, you must also consider their law, the law in that country, data privacy law in that country, and also apply the data privacy law in the original country. So the two must be applied. So according to regulation 1.2 of Nigerian data um, protection regulation, it says NDPR apply to businesses established on all the jurisdictions where the businesses are involved in the processing of the personal data of natural persons who are Nigerian citizens, irrespective of where they reside or Nigerian residents. So meaning that if you need to take data subjects 
of Nigerians to another place, you must consider NDPR. So this regulation must be considered. Who are Nigerian citizens, irrespective of where they reside or Nigerian residents? Thank you. Questions? Thank you all for listening. Any Thank questions? For that, any questions, contributions, or comments, this is the time. Let's take advantage. Can see people clapping. I can see applause. Yeah. Thank you. You may want to drop your contact in the chat box in case anybody would like to reach out to you for additional information subsequently. Okay. You can just type it in the chat box. Then someone is saying, I think this is Tochuku Ume. So as HR professionals, does it mean that the NDPR requires us to get consent of the staff members before we can contact their referees or guarantors? Okay, sorry, say that again. Does it mean that? We require consent before we get employees guarantors or referee before we contact them. The, con the question is on the chat box. Okay, okay. Let me copy it and paste it for you right away. Okay. I just pasted it. Okay, so as HR professionals, does it mean that NDPR requires us to get consent of our staff members before we contact the referees or guarantors? Yes. Yes, you need to get consent from the staff members before you contact. You can just go and contact the referees or guarantors. And that's the reason why I was said, you must also have that data privacy notice policy. Because by the time they're already your staff, they would have signed. So everything would have been there inside that staff privacy notice policy. So if you put everything there, they've signed it, given, given you a copy and they have a copy, so you can go ahead and contact their referees or their guarantors. Is that straightforward? Okay. Um, yeah, Itumalang wants to come up. Go for it. Yes, good evening. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah. Am I audible enough? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes. My question is, um, for an example, uh, when you have an escrow agreement with a third party, where a company becomes liquidated, you ensure that um, we're able to get your data back. Uh, so in terms of um, when um, an organization, is there an agreement in place, sort of same as an escrow agreement to ensure that should maybe they be a ransom, the, um, the service provider is the one that is liable for it instead of the organization. We have that agreement in place. Mm, you mean the company liquidates and then you want to collect your... No, 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 no. no. Right. Yeah, you have the right to collect your information, to collect your personal data from them. But if you are able to see them, that is no, it. No, no, no. Um, okay, my question is, with regard to liquidation, is an example whereby you have an, an escrow agreement with the organization. So my question is, is there a um, similar agreement in place whereby there's a service provider that are responsible for our data? And there's, let's say, a ransom attack is there an agreement to ensure that as an organization, we don't have to pay that um, ransom, the service provider the one that are labeled for paying that ransom? Mm -hmm. I'm not really getting your question. 
Okay. So there's an organization that is responsible for our data. Okay. Correct. Our organization's data. Let's say for in case there's an um there's an attack and then there an a ransom is required. Okay. So okay. my question so, uh, is okay. in, is it you as an individual that was attacked or the company that um, was attacked? Um, okay, let's say I'm Grand Fontaine in this case. Okay. And we have another company that handles our data as a service provider. Okay. In case where well, let's say there's, there's a, a ransom attack and a ransom is required, um, is there an agreement that ensures that as SNG as, as Grand Fountain, we don't pay that ransom, it's liable to the service provider. Do we okay. have that agreement in place? No, no, that is, that is, no, you have the right to, it, it depends on you, you can decide to pay. But the thing is, due to past experience, if you pay the ransom, um, uh, if you pay the ransom money, I'm telling you the information will still not be released. They will require you to pay more. <laughs> so most times um, it is not advisable to pay. Still the information will not be released. Okay, no, thanks yeah, for that. That is how it works with um, this uh, ransom attack. People. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. Kunle, you can go ahead with your question. I can Hello, see. Kunle. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank, yeah. thank you very much. Yes, um, this one is a true life um, uh, event that happened, right? There's okay. someone that works with a multinational organization, an international organization, right? And there was a little bit of um, disagreement in the HR team. So the management of that um, organization decided to bug the office of that my friend. And they were eavesdropping on every single conversation he was having, both official and personal, without his knowledge. And then they used that information to determine his contract. And he's out of job today. What would you advise such a person do? Right now, he doesn't have Ev um, evidence, or no, 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 evidence. He doesn't have facts of what has been, but he was told that his office was bought. And they used all the information or all that was heard and used that to determine his contract. So, what would you advise the person to do? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kunle. I have my senior colleague on the call, um, Mr. Kuda Sharandura. Can you please go for the question? Uh, hi, 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 everyone. I didn't, I didn't quite understand. I didn't quite hear the question. Apologies. Okay, okay. okay. Um, Mr. Kunle said um, the office of somebody was bought, and they now use that. They now leverage on that to you know, listen to all the conversation and the guy was eventually sacked. So as of now, the guy is jobless. What is he supposed to do? Is that right? Well, sorry, yeah. let me just quickly um, clear the air before you respond. Um, it, it's, a, it's a multinational organization, so they didn't use the word sack. What they did was they just did not extend the contract. Is a contract that is renewable and renewable on three conditions. If your performance was good, they will renew. In this case, performance is very good. If um, there's need for the position, in this case, there's need for the position. And finally, if there's um, funding to pay, those are the three conditions that hinges on renewal of the contract. So the three conditions to renew the contract are actually valid and met. But they refused to renew the contract. So they, they ended the contract basically because they eavesdropped on his conversations. Yeah, just to respond to, first of all, if dropping uh, employee, employees' conversations is illegal on its own right. Uh, 
if you are to, you know, you know the data privacy laws, besides the, um, the Nigerian data privacy law, GDPR, uh, even uh, POPIA, doesn't uh, 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 guard against that, right? You cannot just record someone without their consent. Yes, yes. Uh, you need to basically ensure that if you are, if even as an organization, if you are doing monitoring, you need to make sure that you have that uh, documented as a policy and you notify the employees that you're going to be monitoring their conversations, their emails, and they need to consent, consent to that. So even going to the extent of even things like CCTV cameras, make sure that you, you cater for those as well, right? So if dropping without uh, the, the consent of the employees is not really um, something that is uh, legal. And uh, in, your, in, in this case, uh, was the employee then as contract terminated because of what was what was if dropped or because of something else because again it depends on what, what was the basis right uh, if I get you right but if if if, if the evidence uh, um, that was used to to terminate the contract was because of what whatever they if dropped then that can't be uh, illegal actually because you cannot use uh, uh, it's like it's like you're getting evidence, uh, 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 not, not through legal means, right? Mm. So from what I hear, uh, an organization cannot just if drop on employees that they listen to their conversations or even monitor emails, for instance, without consent. Are you are you satisfied? Well, I, I am kind of. Well, really, the organization does not have right to eavesdrop, yes, but what can he do? No, um, he, can, he can sue them. He can sue them. That's the reason why we said uh, most times we don't know our rights as a data subject. So if we know our rights as a data subject, we need to sue. And that is where the issue of... Um, um, data breach comes into place and they need to pay, the, the company needs to pay, they need to pay the man, they need to pay the fine. Okay. And when was, when was this? Was this recent? Yes, this is, um, I think it told me less than a year ago. This, this happened less than a year ago. Yeah, you can still go ahead for it. Of course, you will need to have evidence. Mm -hmm. to back whatever is claims <laughs> and make sure it's not an allegation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah ex ex exactly right. It is, it's like I said, it depends on what resulted. What is it that the employee was, his contract was terminated based on? Was it based on the eavesdropping or was it based on something else, right? So remember, it could be, again, is it an allegation? Is it, what is it based on? Before taking any action, right? The, employees, <laughs> the employee needs to make sure that they the, he or she gets uh, gets his facts or his effects right. right. Okay, thank you, thank you so much for your insights. We are extremely grateful that you have taken time out, you and your highly esteemed colleagues that joined from all over the world. Thank you so much, Ma. I would like to say we are grateful. We do not take your knowledge or your presence or your time for granted. Thank you so much. I don't know if you have any closing remarks so that we can call it an evening. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I also want to appreciate you for giving me the opportunity to present on this platform. It's a great opportunity. And um, so with these services, we also give the services. Um, we perform gap analysis. If you want us to do this for your organization, we are available. Gap analysis on data privacy, if it is security, also cybersecurity risk assessment, we also do this. So um, we are grant hunting, the same grant hunting all over. We're in UK, we're in South Africa, we're also in Nigeria. So if you need our services, we also develop these policies like all these HR policies, if you also need our services who are available, we can assist you in developing them. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh.
All right, so ladies and gentlemen, let's make the best use of whatever is left of the evening. See you. <laughs> Thank, thank you so you, much. Bye. Okay, thank bye. you. Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 bye.